everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Being Me. We're honored to have the opportunity to speak with Michelle Singer and Taylor Dean from the organization Healthy Native Youth. Healthy Native Youth is an organization that promotes the health and well-being of Native youth through culturally responsive education and resources. Their mission is to provide access to accurate information and support for Native youth on various topics, including sexual health, mental health, substance abuse prevention, and healthy relationships. They work in partnership with Native communities to develop and implement culturally appropriate curricula and training programs that support young people's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Healthy Native Youth produces resources for Native teens and caring adults, including online educational materials, training workshops, and community-based outreach initiatives. Overall, Healthy Native Youth is dedicated to empowering Native youth to make informed decisions and lead healthy lives. In this episode, we'll deep dive into the issues facing Native youth, learn more about the outreach and support programs offered by Healthy Native Youth, and learn how the mental health community can better support Native youth. Michelle and Taylor, so happy to have you here with us today. Anything you'd like to add? Thank you so much. We're happy to be here with you. Yes, thank you. Well, what an impressive background you both have. We're so happy that you're here with us and there's clearly a lot to talk about. So let's talk. We like to start our Being Me podcast by asking you to tell us a little bit about what you were like as a teenager. Did you have a nickname? Were you confident or shy? What activities did you participate in? Where'd you grow up? I mean, what were teen Michelle and teen Taylor like? So I grew up in Beaverton, Oregon, and I was a very shy teenager, very artistic, always had my nose in my sketchbook. I was really interested in theater and I did musicals. And my favorite thing to do growing up to cope with stress was to listen to music. Oh, I love that. How about you, Michelle? Well, I grew up in Salem, Oregon. I was born as an off-reservation boarding school child. My parents went to boarding school, so I grew up between two regions, the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest, which is where my reservation is, the Navajo Nation. So I learned right out of the gate to be very nomadic, going back and forth to regions, to weather systems, to climate that were very different. All in all, I loved it. I loved the outdoors. I loved the beauty of the landscape. I was very much a tomboy. I loved sports. I loved music. I was always a very curious child and certainly was a bit of a go-getter. If I liked something, I wanted to go for it. So I would say I was an anxious young person. Thank you for sharing that. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit more about Healthy Native Youth, the mission of the org, your role, maybe give us some idea of the geographic region that you work with as well. And then Taylor, I'd love for you to also share some of your role in what you do at Healthy Native Youth. First and foremost, I would say that Taylor and myself, we work as the Healthy Native Youth dynamic duo here in Portland, Oregon, which is the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Kalapuya and other indigenous nations here in the mid Willamette Valley. We work for the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, which is a nonprofit regional tribal organization that works on behalf of the 43 federally recognized tribes of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Our Healthy Native Youth Project is housed here in Portland. However, we are a part of a collective of regional partners from Alaska to the Southwest and Arizona to the Southern Plains. We do have university partners as well too. So we coordinate healthy native youth out of Portland. However, we have a big family across the country and our mission and our goals is to be able to provide a curriculum that has a native lens for young people that lifts up culture and helps to provide tools and resources to help in our, what we call medicine wheel model to help in a positive strength-based approach for mind, body, and spirit all rooted in culture. And that's our mission that we'd like to do is be able to help our young people, help those who engage youth, as well as the families, the relatives, the grand families, so that we all can work together towards health and healing in our Native communities on and off the reservation. 
My role as the Healthy Native Youth Outreach Specialist is a supportive role to the team. I help create social media posts that promote health messaging. I'm an artist by trade. I went to school for art and this job is really perfect for me because I get to use my skills as an artist and a designer to create brochures for our projects to promote health for Native youth. And I really feel like I'm able to use my strengths in this position in order to reach Native youth where they're at and Native adults and educators by providing those resources, imagery, and tools for our communities. And I would just add that I'm the project manager for Healthy Native Youth. So my role is I get to work with lovely people all across the country, from tribal leaders to school-based programming, including teachers and administrators, with the families and the relatives, and with young people. So I've got a background in working in health, education, public health research, and also community engagement. So Taylor and I, we are very happy and honored to be able to work on behalf of Native people with our people, and more importantly, our youth. It's really interesting. It sounds like you all take a very holistic approach to supporting young Native youth. Michelle, I wanted to come back to something that you mentioned. You mentioned that you take a positive strengths-based approach, and that's something that we really emphasize at BME as well for the teens on our platform. Can you share a little bit about what that looks like and maybe concrete examples? I would just say right back to healthy Native youth in our utilization of culture front and center in the adolescent health programs that we provide. We truly believe and know it is taught to us that culture is prevention, knowing who we are and where we come from and bringing those tools and those lessons that come from our ancestors, but also from our Indian nations. Interweaving those particular lessons and that identification for our young people to help them in their development and being able to affirm them in their identities, culturally, gender, sexually, as well as also to giving them the tools and the resources and letting them know that they are valued, that we need them, and they are wanted and loved. And we approach that in ways of mind, body, and spirit in a holistic approach. That's such a powerful message. I'm wondering if you can share some of the unique challenges faced by Native teenagers and how those might differ from those faced by non-Native teens. And do Native teens living on tribal lands or on reservations face different challenges than, than even Native teens living in urban or suburban areas? I'd love for you to shed some light on that for us. What Native teens uniquely experience is something called generational trauma. It is the experience of our ancestors and negative things that may have happened to them that gets passed down through our blood. We remember it and we store it in our bodies. And this generational trauma can affect everything from how we feel about ourselves, how we respond to stressors, to how our families are structured, how our communities are structured, and the breakdown of how our communities were traditionally structured deeply impacts all of us on the day-to-day basis. So a part of what we want to do at Healthy Native Youth is try to find ways to heal from some of that trauma, to reconnect with our traditions and our people and bring our communities back together to a healthy place. Specifically, people who live on reservations primarily experience a lack of access to adequate psychiatrists and therapists. There are many communities within our 43 recognized tribes that maybe have one one therapist and one psychiatrist for the entire reservation at their clinic. So maybe that psychiatrist can only come to the reservation one day a month as well on top of that. So each individual session might be five minutes long. There might not be time to get a proper adequate diagnosis for teens struggling with specific mental health. They may be misdiagnosed, put on medications that aren't going to work for them. That's like 
something that we see a lot when we speak with our youth delegates as well, is that is their biggest concern is getting enough psychiatrists and therapists onto the reservations in IHS clinics and tribal clinics. I am an urban native and my biggest struggle with my mental health was finding those connections with my people when I wasn't living on the reservation and kind of overcoming some of this cultural confusion of like, what does it mean to be me? in a world that has taught me to be one way when I know that my culture says another thing. So kind of trying to reconnect with traditions as an urban native is something that I personally have dealt with a lot in my own mental health journey. Thank you so much for sharing that very personal experience. I mean, you shed a lot of light on this for us. I think what you said about cultural confusion would resonate with a lot of teens who are listening. And I love that question that you posed to yourself because I think that Everybody asks this question of themselves starting the teenage years, and it doesn't end there. And the question was, what does it mean to be me? We're always exploring various aspects of our identities, whether it is cultural confusion or something completely unrelated. But, you know, we're all trying to figure out who am I? What does it mean to be me? What does it not mean to be me? What do I stand for, et cetera? So really, really powerful thought. And I appreciate your, again, just being really open and sharing that experience. Michelle, anything that you would add? I would just say that Taylor touched on it. In our communities, we hear about this big word, intergenerational trauma. And as they mentioned about the connections between one generation of others, and we as a people today inherit this blood memory. And I think we're at a time and a place, and especially with emphasizing your question about the word unique, we are a unique American Indian Alaska Native population, unlike any other racial ethnic group that has a relationship, a political relationship with the United States. So we have unique systems, we have unique land bases, we have unique sovereign governments that we abide by and work with and come from. It's a very complicated issue that not many people would know. They don't learn it in school, but a lot of our Native young people know they know that they're Native and or if they don't know they're Native, they want to find out more. So to Taylor's point about cultural confusion, there is that. And that's one of the things that we try to address with our young people is to who they are and where they come from and embrace that and be me, be true to who they are and own it. And we as a community rally around them and affirming them. Michelle, you mentioned something else that was really important that I wanted to come back to, and it's the idea of intergenerational trauma. Can you speak a little bit more about how you think we can break some of those patterns that the trauma is not necessarily passed down generation to generation? Well, I think one of the things right now where we're seeing in this generation of young people is they're beginning to lift up their voices. They're beginning to want to change the tide of all of that absolutely historical trauma and hurt and pain and they want to really affirm themselves and who they are not only as i mentioned in identity and that can be three different things it could be it's their cultural their native pride their gender identity their sexual identity and they're really owning who they are and being present and what I think is really beautiful about this in this generation is it's really for myself and those older than me are seeing a voice and a rise and a movement that's bringing us back to the times of the late 1960s and the early 70s. You know, this is a time of Indian self-determination and advancement. And that's beautiful. But what we're doing and what we're seeing now is this interconnectedness of generations coming together and learning from each other the elders to the youth and the youth to the elders and those caring adults in between. It's a circle of life. It's a circle of learning and bringing contemporary and traditional methods together and trying to find a common language and one heart and one mind as they're moving forward. And it's a beautiful time right now. And that's the strength that we offer in a lot of these resources, technology being very important in this. And so we're trying to meet youth where they're at, but we're also telling the youth, you've got to meet elders where they're at. So trying to broker communication and relationships in a good way is what we call good medicine. It's good medicine to help those hurts and those ills, but we still have a lot of work to do. 
I love what you said about a circle of learning and one heart, one mind, and kind of creating that shared language and brokering that communication. It's such a powerful visual comes to mind for me. I want to dig into what you said about things like technology. But before we do that, I'm curious if you can share with us and our listeners a little bit more about the stigma towards mental health that might exist in the communities that you work with. I think that since we are existing in a post-colonial world, a world where in the past mental health had been something that had either been highly regulated to institutions, white institutions that do not leave room for difference or try to build healing and strength, but rather try to medicalize and are very punitive. I think that a lot of our elders and older generations are coming from that understanding of what mental health is. People were not really allowed to talk about their mental health for a very long time. So that is something that we are trying to build here at the board is these intergenerational lines of communication through examples such as our Mind for Health campaign. It is a SMS text campaign that helps elders to caring adults learn how to communicate with youth about mental health issues, how to spot signs of a potential suicide risk, how to go through their child's social media and make sure that the things that they are saying aren't indicating some sort of suicide risk. So those are the ways in which we're trying to build up. And like by saying it's okay for your kid to struggle, but here's how we can help your kid overcome this. And here's how we can help you help your kid overcome this. I think one thing I'd like to add on that too is this gets back to the historical timeline of generations such as myself and older that went to boarding school or were exposed to the boarding school, federal boarding school or off-reservation boarding school experience, which it was quasi-militant. It was a very cold, very firm place that really instilled lessons of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, suck it up or cowboy up, however you want to label it. And, you know, it really, I think in that child rearing parents, like my parents, or sometimes even myself, you become hardened and the babies and the young people inherit that. They see and they learn from that style of child rearing. So what it does and the impacts that it does is it really, for a young person who needs help, and or even that adult, we were taught really not how to appropriately or confidently ask for help. Feelings were not even words that were in the vocabulary about how to feel wasn't taught. I know for a fact, when somebody would ask me, how are you feeling? Words like, okay, I'm fine, good, all right. Those aren't feeling words. You know, today, young people and what we're trying to do in our resources and healthy Native youth is to try to teach those basic emotional words to our young people. And even to us as adults, we're learning side by side. I feel sad. I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm happy. You know, I'm content. Things like that. And even I'm still struggling to try to find those words. But I think the thing is that we're utilizing technology and text messaging campaigns and social media to demonstrate and to show people with cultural identification, with cultural actors, Native actors, or cultural messaging and vocabulary, like It's okay to be who you are and to feel this way, but we're with you together. My nurture, grow, and heal. Those are kind of our buzzwords. I think the idea of building that vocabulary for how you feel or developing that language or what I refer to as emotional literacy is so important, especially when it comes to fighting stigma. Because if you give people the tools that they need to start speaking about it, the more we then speak about it, the more the stigma starts to reduce. I want to come back to this idea of technology because you mentioned it a couple of times. What do you think that technology can do to better support Native teens, young people, adults? I mean, I'd love to hear your perspective on, I guess, the promise there and then maybe even the risks involved. I can start out by saying that one thing about technology that is very convenient 
and it can be confidential as if one signs up for a text messaging campaign and or the message or DMing or Instagram, you're connecting people one-to-one in a virtual space. So it's immediate, it's fast, it's direct to you. Also too, we talked a little bit about Indian America, Turtle Island and rural spaces. Sometimes you may not have access to care utilizing technology and virtually, and we know from COVID, a lot of people started utilizing technology to help get access to care or respond to needs. So we like to meet youth where they're at. A lot of folks like their phones. They like their apps like Be Me. It's a very helpful app to get right at your fingertips, multimedia health sources that are credible and have interesting articles or information that youth can identify with, as well as adults to know that this is there for their youth. The risks that are involved is sometimes media literacy, setting boundaries, being careful about what information is posted and exposed to the virtual universe. Unfortunately, there is a segment out there that is not with the best intentions. And so making sure that our young people are aware of setting boundaries and what healthy use of technology looks like and what positive factors can be there, but also perhaps some challenges or negative use can mean and look like. And then also letting parents know how they can, and caring adults, how they can take a look and see and have tools about how to respond if they see concerning posts. How do they know how to do it in a gentle way, but in a way that expresses some skill building and behavior tools for our young people? Taylor? I used to be a substitute teacher, and I feel like working in that role, I did see a lot of the negative repercussions of social media. And I just want kids to be aware, like, you don't have to put up with it if you don't want to. I really encourage teens, if they're being bullied on TikTok or whatever, like it's okay to delete that app off your phone. There are a lot of really wonderful things about technology, but also remember that if you need to unplug because somebody is harassing you or making you feel unsafe, that I absolutely encourage like trying to get some space from that for a while. And I appreciate all that you highlighted. I'm curious as to your perspectives, Michelle and Taylor, For apps like BeMe or platforms that use technology that are aiming to support all teens and young people, what would you want us to keep in mind or them to keep in mind when it comes to supporting Native youth? What do we want to make sure to have on the platform? We'd really love to hear your perspective. Well, for me, I think the one thing resonates with the American Indian Alaska Native community is cultural identification. I think folks want to be able to see themselves in the the information, the pictures, yeah. the articles or information that, that they can identify with. Touching on various health topics is wonderful. We all need health and medically reliable and accurate information. However, we know out of Healthy Native Youth and our sister partners, I know mine.org out of Alaska. And we are native.org, which is for the lower 48. These are specifically tailored multimedia websites that youth can access and also text to be able to get messages that are specifically tailored for them. So being creative, being sensitive to identification, cultural competency in the wording. I appreciate the one size fits all approach on information for youth, but again, As we talked about earlier, the unique relationship that American Indian Alaska Native people and youth have and their service delivery systems is we have to be making sure that this is relevant to them. And appreciate BME for the work that you all are doing, because the more that we put information out there, it takes away the stigma of fear. And really the privacy that one can look at these apps, they can go right to their phone and look at it one-to-one for themselves, by themselves, or maybe with others. So creating safe spaces around gathering information is always important. The idea of safe spaces anywhere for anyone is always, I think, the most important. Indeed. I want to learn a little bit more about your traditional healing practices. What role do you think that they can play in supporting the mental health of Native youth? So 
Native youth, I don't think that you can disconnect cultural practices and mental health for Native people and Native youth specifically, because the way that we are going to overcome that key issue of generational trauma is through practicing our traditional medicines. So one way that we heal a Native community is through drum circles, sweat lodges, canoe journeys. These things, they bring people together. They give us a culturally relevant activity to do. And through being with your people, through physical exercise, through medicine, you're able to build that sense of pride and overcome some of that brokenness from the generational trauma and heal from that. Here in Oregon, we have a lot of urban Native organizations aimed at healing, but maybe Michelle wants to go into that a little bit deeper. Well, what I would say is our American Indian Alaska Native communities are so diverse. We have unique land bases, as we talked about, often called reservations. And then we have many Native people, including youth, that live in urban settings. But however, all of that may be, the point being is that some way, somehow, there has to be a connection to culture. And again, our mantra is culture is prevention. And when we talk about the circle of life and that connection of the holistic medicine wheel or the model, we have to know where we come from in order to be able to know where we're going. And that includes our youth being those young messengers. They carry our message forward as a people. They are our ancestors' dream. The fact that we're still here as a people, given where all of the historical trauma has taken us. And so we always like to be able to instill upon our young people to be proud of who they are, all youth. The youth are sacred. And every youth and every individual, every human being comes from somewhere. So knowing who you are and taking pride in that self-esteem and that connection to community and with others is what makes us as a people and I think as human beings so strong. And a part of that healing practice is connecting with others to continue to carry on what our ancestors have done, our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, even today young people. That's why that elder youth voice, that connection is so important. So Taylor gave some examples, but we do have organizations, we have tribes, we have programs all across the country that's doing something near you. I just have to say what you just shared was, again, so powerful. I got goosebumps when you said we have to know where we come from in order to know where we're going. And I love the way that you talked about youth as sacred. It was really just beautifully articulated. I'm wondering... And you talked about this earlier as well, that there's programs to support youth and elders. And you talked about that circle of learning and that bi-directional communication around mental health. Do you have any examples or advice that you would share for how elders might be able to check in with Native youth better about their mental health or how youth might speak about some of these topics with their elders that they may not have broached before? Well, I think that's a very important question. I would include myself as an elder in training. I'm a Gen Xer and I am a grandma. I have nieces and nephews and they have kids. So that's very important for us as we get to a certain age in life. And even for young people, there's always someone younger than you. And to keep that circle strong, we have to give gratitude to those who came before us. Our wisdom keepers is what we call them. And then you give to those behind you. They're always looking to you as well. That's what keeps our people strong. And I think the one thing that's interesting about this time with elders is they want to connect with their young people, but they're a little nervous. They're a little fearful. They're humans as well, too. So they're a little scared. So what Healthy Native Youth offers is tools for parents and caring adults about how to have sensitive conversations with their young person. Again, we fall back on media, social media and text messaging. We have a Talking is Power program where adults and caring adults can text the word EMPOWER to 94449. And as Taylor had mentioned before, we have a Mind for Health text messaging campaign, which is another 
text messaging campaign where an adult can text the word mind, the number four, the word health to 65664. That's a text messaging campaign that nurtures conversations with young people about taking away the stigma around mental health. It's geared for adults. So if you have any youthful listeners out there, send them to Healthy Native Youth and have their caring adults sign up for it. We all need a little help, even us as elders. We want to learn. We love our children, but we too also learn side by side with them. And for the youth, what we also offer is our caring messages campaign. We want to let young people know that they should be proud of who they are, where they come from. We all need a little help. We have difficult times. But if they text the word caring to 65664, they'll get messages from their relatives letting them know how awesome they are and that through being proud of who they are, they're appreciated, they're valued, they're sacred, and we need them. So those are some examples that we have, and that can be found through wearenative.org as well as iknowmine.org. So we cover all bases. Yeah, well, wonderful resources. I appreciate your sharing those. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the online world just because technology and the use of technology is so common. So Taylor, this question's for you. One of the things that we see on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and the social media platforms is that many creators are using it as a tool to boost representation of their communities, which are often marginalized in mainstream media, right? Can you share a little bit about how you see Native creators embracing these platforms to educate others and also showcase Native culture and what Native creators should we be following? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I see Native people using TikTok. I see them using Instagram. I see Native artists all over Instagram. And it's a really amazing community to see people being able to use the web to share our cultures together and to connect with each other. One artist that comes to mind because she just had an exhibition at the Pittock Mansion in Portland, Oregon, and she gave a talk on her new book that she illustrated called My Powerful Hair. I believe her Instagram name is Art Nerd for Life. I will have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. She is a member of the Grand Ron Confederated Tribes, and I believe she is Kalapuya. She really pushes the boundaries of Native art by bringing so much vibrant neon color and kind of showing how neons are used in Native art and a lot of depictions of Native art made by non Natives, it's very sepia-toned and looks like it's something from a long ago past, but I believe that her work really shines through that we are here in the present, that we are a part of the modern world, we're a part of the urban world, we're a part of the rural world, and if we're not going anywhere, we were not destroyed, we are still very much alive. I really enjoy using Healthy Native Youth for my own artwork. I like to be able to make art for our Instagram account. We had a weekly slang Sunday little post that we did. And I would make a new art piece for that every week. And we would have intergenerational conversations about slang. So we would have showcase like boomer slang. We would showcase Gen X slang, millennial slang, Gen Z slang, and kind of showing that maybe we're all saying the same thing. It's just coming out in different ways. I love that. Thank you so much for highlighting those. I can't wait to check out your account and check out some of the ones that you listed. Before we go, very last question for you. What advice do you have for teens, specifically for Native teens? Never give up on trying to find out who you are, even if people don't understand or don't understand why your culture or your gender identity are important to you. Just keep looking, keep finding, keep being introspective, keep asking questions, keep trying to find somebody that you can relate to that makes you feel safe. Just don't give up because you will find it. I know I did. It took me many years to find people who understood me and saw me for who I was, but I'm so glad that I didn't give up looking. My advice to young people today would be Enjoy this time in your life, even though it may be challenging, it may be frustrating, but also too, there is a beauty in living a life today. 
There's so many that came before you that dreamed about you. You are here. And that right there is a means for celebration. Always know that there's those that come before you that are there for you. And then there's also that those who come before you and are with you who are older are looking to you to help them so that you can stand side by side and know where we're going. If anything, always know that one of our native teachings that I think is universal for all people is love, patience, honesty, humility, and gratitude. That we all are one on this earth and we all have to live together, but we need each other and we need you as young people. So we look forward to seeing the journey that's ahead for you and we'll continue to be with you and support you. I love that. Michelle Taylor, again, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your joining us. Until next time, this is Dr. Neha Chaudhary, along with our podcast producer, Derek Baird, reminding you to keep being you.